Hi, everybody. Welcome to Predictable Success. Don't leave growth to chance. We're going to, Jenny, let's give everybody a few minutes to get in here. Perfect. If their Wi-Fi is anything like the Wi-Fi challenges we've had, just getting ready, <laughs> we'll give them an extra couple minutes. I think the Wi-Fi in, in, in general is ready to be on a break after it this is. year, right? It is. I think we all should just shut off Wi-Fi between Christmas and New Year, <laughs> more for the Wi-Fi than for us. That sounds like actually a really nice suggestion. <laughs> I was just talking to somebody this morning about how the world collectively just needs a break. We just oh. need a little time out here, I think. Uh, yes, I think that's exactly right. So good. All right, let's jump into this. I want to make sure we have plenty of time because it is no secret to Jenny or to anyone around me that this is some of my favorite business content that I've ever come across. And, and Jenny, we're getting to be the older gals sometimes in the room these days. I don't know. I know. Yeah, I'm not sure. Young gals. Yes. But, but when you've been in the business world for any length of time, it seems like there's no new content under the sun, right? Everything that right. comes out is a, is a remodel of something else. And honestly, there are a lot of business growth models. But what I can tell you is when we found the predictable success model, actually you introduced us to the predictable success model many years ago. And when you did, I thought it was good content, but it didn't mean as much to me as it did a couple years later when we hit what you're gonna to explain to us in a little bit, we now know as Whitewater, when we okay. hit that at 555, and, and we were year after year, um, you know, 50% growth plus, right. and we were just going, and it was exciting, and it was fun, and we were growing. And then at some point, we hit this period where everything, the best I can describe it, everything felt a little more difficult. Right. It all felt difficult. It wasn't quite as fun as it had been a few years before. Um, I'll never forget that somebody actually asked me, it was, it was a couple of years ago, and they said, would you rather go through that or 2020 again? And I really had to think about it, <laughs> but I yes. actually decided 2020 because the, the other part I felt like was, was on us. I mean, we were not making yes. the right decisions and we're getting stuck. And 2020 feels like all these external things that you know we're all doing our best to manage in spite of. So all that to say, it can be really painful. And we found this model again, the predictable success model. And as I was reading through that book, I mean, I, I, I still have that copy. Every page is underlined and highlighted, and particularly when it got to that whitewater section. And then what you do, very practical steps, which is what I also love about this model. It's not just business theory. It is practical application of, so what? Now, what do right. I do to get out of it? And it became, it became our guidebook for the next year to move us to what is now we know is predictable success. And I'll also tell you that I'm gonna shut up and let you talk, but I'll also tell right. you that I have said many times through uh, what we went through in 2020, that had we not done the work to get to predictable success, it, it would have been a really different story for us, having to for move sure. remote and all the things that happened. So all that to say, I am a huge believer in predictable success because I've seen what it has done for us at five by five. And I also know when we've introduced it to clients, I know what it has done for them and their understanding, not only of where they're at as a business right. or organization, but how to get to the next level. So Jenny, I am going to um, go off screen here for a minute. I'm going to let you talk. Um, let me I, let me also do a really good job of introducing you. Jenny Katrin is a great friend of mine. She's the person that I don't get to see as much as I like, but I know I can call you anytime I have a question and I'm stuck. Same, yes. And I do that from time to time. Um, and you are also a licensed, a predictable success licensed practitioner. And you're also the CEO of Foresight Consulting. Jenny does awesome work in business growth and strategy and also in how you build exceptional cultures within organizations, which you know is something else I believe is really important. So if you will take us through this model, after you do that, Jenny, then I'm going to come back on. I've got a couple other guests we're going to bring in as well. Perfect. And I want to ask you a few questions that have come up for us. And then also we want to walk people through 
what some of the things that we've seen clients do successfully and not successfully okay. in these different phases. All right, you Perfect. ready? I love it. Yep. Okay. This is great. Thank away. you. Awesome. Well, Shannon, thanks so much. And I'm glad that you all are joining us for this uh, webinar. It is, this model is so helpful and I didn't create it. I can't take credit for it. Les McCowan is the founder of Predictable Success. And I have the privilege of being one of a handful of licensed practitioners of the model. And very similar to Shannon, I had uh, the same like aha moment with the content. I've been a part of numerous organizations, both uh, in uh, business, uh, in the corporate world, and in uh, ministry and nonprofit world. And what was so powerful about this model is that it really applies in any organizational setting, whether you're in for-profit, nonprofit, uh, ministry context, whatever it might be, the model still stands. And so what I'm going to do today, um, the thing about this model is that there are just layers to it. Um, it just builds upon itself. So I'm going to give you a really quick flyover in 20 or 25 minutes, and give you a really quick flyover of what is the model, what's going on in the organization, what's going on with us as leaders. And I think those two things are probably uh, what I love so much about the predictable success model is we look we look objectively at what's happening in the organization. And then we also look at what's happening with us as leaders in the organization. And then what's required to help us eclipse some of those growth hurdles. And Shannon mentioned that season that she and their team uh, we're just trying to wrestle through and just the light bulbs that come on when you have a little more understanding of what does the organization need and what do I need to adjust as a leader to help get us there. And uh, so I'm going to give you the quick flyover of the model and um, that it, there'll probably be some generalities. They'll leave you with a few more questions and I would just encourage you to get the book and check it out more deeply. We'll give you an assessment link that you can take and things like that to just kind of help you take a few other steps. But I'm gonna share my screen with you because I think one of the things I love so much about the predictable success model is that you can, uh, the visuals of being able to see it and understand what's happening. So give me a second here and I'm gonna share my screen with you all. All right. So, um, you know, predictable success don't just grow scale. I think all of us long for that um, as founding leaders or, you know, leaders in whatever seat that you are in inside your organization. Uh, but we really want to see growth. And so what you see here is the life cycle of every organization. Um, there is down in the bottom left is that squiggly line that is the, the starting point of every organization. And then we grow up into the right and we hit that, uh, that pinnacle of growth. And then there is a decline side of organizational life, which none of us want to be true of our organizations, but um, oftentimes that's the reality. The beautiful thing about the predictable success model and, and organizational life is that we don't actually have to stay, we don't have to move into decline. There are actually things we can do uh, as leaders to help keep us in that, that top of that bell curve and what we call predictable success. And so that's what I'm gonna just share with you today is some of the things that are happening at each of these seven stages on the organizational life cycle and what to kind of expect and anticipate in that stage. And then what you as a leader may be able to do to help um, move you into really the stage into back into predictable success. So the first stage down in that bottom left, we call early struggle. This is if you have been the founding leader of an organization, you understand this so well. It is just that stage of, you know, of early, early struggle early growth, where you are just trying to get the business, the organization off the ground. You're looking for that profitable, sustainable market, right? And we know uh, statistically that it typically takes about two to five years to break through early struggle. And you also know the statistics that if you don't break through early struggle in two to five years, you are 80% of businesses and ministries uh, are typically uh, don't survive those first couple of years. And so we, there's a high mortality rate in this stage. And you know that if you've been a founding leader of an organization, you understand there's this urgency to just keep adjusting and figuring things out to be able to push through early struggle and find that profitable, sustainable market. Now, What's happening from a leadership perspective in early struggle, it is that it is very much led by a visionary. You know, so that visionary is the person who is a long-term thinker, who is, is that visionary, creative, risk taker. Um, they're just going after it, right? They are just, um, they just, they, they, you know, they're the people that we kind of marvel at and we think, 
I don't know how they do it. I don't know how they have the courage to do it, but they just have that big vision and that big passion for whatever mission they have in front of them. And so most organizations are started by a high visionary leader who has what it takes to kind of push through early struggle. Now quickly, in order to get through early struggle, a visionary needs to bring along what we call the operator. And this is your ruthless task finisher. This is the get it done person. So I played this role for a number of years in the organizations that I was a part of and that I would come alongside a great visionary and I was just the figure it out, make it happen. Uh, I often said that my role when I was in the, the second chair seat in uh, organizations was the put feet to vision person. Like what's that vision that visionary has? All right, I'm gonna go figure out how to make it happen. I'm gonna align a group of people. We're gonna, we're gonna just figure out and make it happen. So the operator is pretty fast moving um, as well. So they can kind of match the energy of the visionary but they are, they are ruthless in putting feet to that vision and helping that vision become a reality. And that combination of leadership is, help, is what helps catapult an organization out of early struggle. And so you can see that the blue star ref reflecting the operator is, is, comes in kind of in late early struggle, right before you jump into what we call fun. Um, and again, if you have been a part of a young, fast moving organization, you understand this, that this idea of the fun stage of organizational life in, in a business context, it's sell, 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 right? Like you just are just trying to keep up with the opportunities. It's still a highly flexible organization. And so, you know, you're very nimble, you're very quick moving, you can adjust quickly, you know, this is, these are the organizations where you hear, oh my gosh, we landed that huge contract, or we have this big opportunity, and we pull the all-nighters, and everybody just chips in, and we figure it all out, right? And those become the myths and the legends in our culture, uh, the stories that we tell for years to come of like, can you believe when we landed that thing, and, um, or when we had this opportunity, and we, were, we just pulled it off and we made it happen. I don't know how we did it, right? Those are the stories that cre get created and fun because there's such energy inside of the organization. Everybody's so excited about what they're a part of um, that they just, we just all pitch in because we're so excited that we're actually seeing momentum towards that purpose, that mission that we started with. It's like, we're feeling it, we're doing it, it's happening. We also say that there's kind of the rise of the big dogs in this era where you kind of get your, your, uh, your legends, um, of, you know, the people legends in the culture, you know, the, the people that have a lot more influence and in, inside of the organization. Um, and, uh, and that can be good or bad. It's just something that is, and so we need to be aware of it. But what's also happening in fun is that our complexity is increasing. And so you were also starting to feel that and it, uh, we start to feel some of the effects of that, which leads us to the stage and, and Shannon referenced this, that stage of white water, where all of a sudden what was going so well, we were feeling this momentum, we were excited, we were, you know, we were uh, closing those deals, we were growing, we were expanding, we were seeing all the momentum that we hoped for. And all of a sudden we start to see mistakes and errors. Like things that we didn't miss before, we're missing now. Like we're, we are, we are, we're just seeing mistakes and errors throughout the organization, um, which become really frustrating to that founder visionary. Um, profitability might be plummeting here where it's like, we've kind of lost sight of what it's actually costing us. We're like booking all, you know, new business or we're, we're seeing growth, but we haven't, our systems and our infrastructure haven't caught up to help us see our profitability. And so we start to see some profitability issues. Um, there's a bit of a loss of control that the leader is like, doesn't feel like they have a handle on everything that's happening. Um, and they feel a little, uh, just a little anxious. Typically that visionary and that operator will feel a little sense of anxiety of like, I don't feel like I have control of this. I don't really know what's going on. And they, they feel there's just an anxiety in the culture because it's getting bigger, it's getting more complex and we don't quite have a handle on it. So that loss of control, there's a loss of alignment. All of a sudden, you know, and the team typically through fun has grown really fast. And so we're seeing that growth in the team 
And at first it all feels good. And then you start to realize that there's things that just feel a little off. They're not quite fully aligned with what we're about or how we do things. Um, this is, you know, uh, Shannon referenced that we speak a lot about team culture and the importance of creating great uh, culture within a team. And this is typically when we feel culture start to drift. Uh, because we've added a lot of people, we've increased complexity. Uh, and I love the, the, the image of whitewater, right? We just, if you've been in a stage of, if you've been in this stage of growth in, in an organization, you, you're nodding your head because you're like, yes, that is exactly what it feels like. We're just kind of flailing and we don't feel like we have control. We're not really feel like we're driving this thing. We kind of feel like we're being driven by it. Um, and the, the, the key part here is that there is a need for systems that now exists in the organization uh, that is critical to propelling us into predictable success. And that's difficult sometimes, especially if the same leadership has been a part of the organization from the beginning, that visionary and that operator uh, their success happened in that, in that early struggle and fun where they could just be highly reactive and responsive and they didn't, you know, overly, uh, didn't, didn't create so much systems that it felt like it was slowing things down. But in fact, once we get to whitewater, that need for systems and processes is actually exactly what you need to propel yourselves through whitewater but it goes against everything that is instinctual, especially to the visionary and the operator. And so you see the emergence here of a third leadership style that we call the processor. Uh, that processor is the person who does think systems and infrastructure. They think, okay, how do we put some more of the foundational elements into this organization to help give us the stability that enables to, us to still have the level of flexibility and control that's essential for a healthy organization? Um, and when I'm talking about these leadership styles, it's not that you didn't have maybe some systems people or some processes in the organization prior to this. You had to build some of that. Um, hopefully you had some accounting systems and processes to make sure you're paying the bills and, you know, and, and keeping things on track. But there's a new level of systems and process that are necessary to give us to really to mature us as an organization to be able to, to live in predictable success. And I want to make a note here because uh, this is really key. The, while predictable success is the top of that bell curve, and feels like the pinnacle that we're all aspiring to, there are actually two stages of the organizational life, um, the or, uh, organizational uh, life that you can be in and want to aspire to be in. And it's either fun or it's predictable success. And I wanna give you a little caveat here because a lot of times we assume that the goal is predictable success, but there are some leaders that deliberately choose to stay in fun but it's a deliberate choice to do slow and sustained growth and not scaling growth. And that's a very, very important distinction because most of us want more scaled growth. Most of the leaders that I talk to um, want to be able to, to scale their organizations uh, to a level that, that necessitates predictable success. But there are the occasional um, solopreneur or smaller organization that says, you know what, I'm not looking for fast growth or some, you know, significant growth. I just kind of want to keep a steady business that's very manageable. And it is okay to choose to stay in fun, but it's a very deliberate decision. If you want significant growth, or if you want the ability to scale, you have to push through Whitewater to get your organization to predictable success. And that requires that these three leadership voices are at the most senior leadership table. And this is where I see most organizations not quite get it right, because the visionary and the operator are very comfortable together. High vision, high, like make it happen attitude from the operator, and they coexist really nicely. The challenge that happens for organizations when they're trying to push through whitewater is to bring a processor style, somebody who thinks more methodically, who processes things more carefully, um, typically operates with mm, kind of a, a no first because they've got to work it out and think it through. And that combination of leadership voices can start to create some complexity at the leadership table that often either keeps us, often keeps us trapped in whitewater because Frequently, the visionary leader is, has difficulty 
uh, bringing that processor voice to the table with them. And so that combination of leadership styles at it or in Whitewater is really important to push us to predictable success where we get that controlled and yet flexible, um, where there are appropriate systems where vision and creativity are still happening, but now with a, a bit more of a controlled and flexible uh, balance. Um, do we do sometimes lose some of those big dogs? Th those people that were the big legends in our culture might not love that we have to be a little more mature, have a little more system and process in what we do and how we do it. Um, and so sometimes you kind of mourn the loss of some key people because of we're just moving to a different stage as an organization. And there are certain people that thrive in early struggle and fun and actually love being a part of those types of organizations. And when we move into predictable success, which by the way, is also fun. So I don't want to discredit the fact that predictable success is actually a really energizing place to be, but it takes significant work to push through whitewater to get there. And oftentimes you will have key leaders that were a part of founding the organization that um, maybe just don't love uh, the, the, um, uh, what needs to change organizationally to, to live in predictable success in a healthy way. And the key about predictable success, this is the thing I love about it, is that theoretically you can stay in predictable success indefinitely. So you don't have to shift over into the decline stages. But I do want to give you a quick view of these decline stages because some of you might be a part of organizations that are on the in the declining stages and there's still hope. So I wanna give you a little bit of a perspective of what's happening over there and what you as a leader can do to help maybe push back into predictable success. Um, I will say to you, I have been a part of organizations in every stage um, except death rattle. <laughs> and if we're in death rattle, which we'll talk about in a minute, we're closing the doors. It's kind of, uh, it's kind of done, but I have been a part of an organizations in every one of these stages. And I really think that, um, just understanding what's happening and being deliberate about what do I need to do as a leader and a leadership team to help us aim for predictable success is just really eye opening. Um, thought there. So uh, let me tell you what's happening. So what's happening in predictable success, if we start, if our visionary gets bored, um, we often get left with just operators and processors. My two little guys here are moving at the bottom of the screen. My operators and processors are left. And when that happens is if a visionary gets bored, if they decide to move on, when we're in predictable success, if we lose that visionary edge, then we can shift into treadmill where we become over-processed, it's form over function, function um, loss of vision, um, creativity starts to decline. And um, the beauty of this is that we can still self-diagnose. You'll learn in the later stages that it's much more harder to diagnose organizationally. Um, but um, we can return to predictable success from this place. And here's where I see this happen a lot, is a founding leader kind of gets bored because the organization has got more just more mature and they can't be as quick and nimble as they were in early struggle. And there are just some people, you see this happen in businesses all the time where the board will oust the um, founding leader because the founding leader still wants that, that high visionary still wants to operate like a, a, a entrepreneur at the early struggle stage. And if, if the founding leader doesn't shift their behavior, we still need their visionary perspective but we need them to also value these other voices and equally include them at the table. If that founding leader wants to keep operating with more of that entrepreneurial mindset um, disproportionately, and they will often exit or be exited, then what can happen is the organization can tilt into treadmill and we start to feel this overprocessed loss of vision. Um, this can happen in organizations that maybe the founding leader left by choice or being pushed out, and then the organization is stuck there until a visionary leader is brought back in, and that can push you back into predictable success. Um, if the operator, if that goes on too long, we have no visionary, all of a sudden an operator feels like, I don't know what to do. I don't have a vision to chase. I don't have, you know, I don't know what to do with myself. Then that operator can also exit, leaving just processors. And that will often push us into the big rut um, where we just, it's just this long, slow, highly bureaucratic, um, 
we, it becomes really difficult to self-diagnose here. So this, if you move into the big rut, it gets a lot, lot harder to push back into predictable success. Um, and, and often there's no escape that ultimately pushes us to death rattle, which I didn't even show, show you there. Um, oh, sorry, hold on. I don't know. I actually, I must have hit the wrong button. Sorry about that, y'all. Um, so here's uh, something I want to leave you with, and then we're going to um, open it up because I know Shannon's got some questions and we want to uh, address some of the, the things that are also happening from a marketing perspective in each of these stages. But the, the commitment from leadership as you move through, uh, especially moving from whitewater into predictable success, is that those leaders at the table need to really work from what we call the enterprise commitment that when working in a team or a group environment, I'll place the interests of the enterprise above my personal interests. And this is really key, right? Because if you think about the, those dynamics of those personalities I described, that visionary is that, that it just has a, a they're very energized by um, just seeing quick growth and making things happen and, and putting feet to that vision. And if that visionary doesn't think on behalf of the whole organization, recognizing that we're maturing and we need to move into predictable success. And I've got to place the interests of the organization above my personal interest to just be more entrepreneurial. Like the visionary has to embrace that, that they're saying, you know what? And maybe, maybe then that visionary founding leader does a couple of side projects to kind of uh, help them uh, exercise that entrepreneurial muscle, but they're placing the interests of the enterprise, the entire organization above their personal interest or drive to just start and create new things all the time. The operator's doing the same. The operator's recognizing, you know what? I've got to make sure that I'm not so fast moving that I'm dismissing systems and processes. Operators are notorious for finding a way to get things done, but doing them by cutting corners. Um, so operators are sometimes poor rule followers. And so they have to be more respectful of the systems and processes that a processor is going to introduce. At the same time, the processor needs to be con conscious of they can, they can, uh, slow things down, um, and, and some of that's healthy, but if they need to be conscious of, they're sometimes going to be a little slower than the organization needs, and so they need to be conscious of that. So there's two things happening when we're talking about uh, the predictable success model, is that there's what's happening in the organization and being aware of where we are in that growth cycle, and then understanding what's going on with us as leaders and leadership teams and how to best serve the organization above our personal interests to keep propelling us into uh, that predictable, that place of predictable success. So um, I will pause there and I'm going to stop sharing my screen and Shannon, I want to hear what you're, you're stewing over after no, walking actually, through that again. I'm, I'm texting Mike and Josh right now because I'm still hearing things that I missed in it. Um, every time you do that, there's something that comes out and we, I love where we get to sit with so many different clients because we also see clients in all of these different phases yep. and it's really helpful to us. We've actually talked about having clients take the predictable success quiz before we work with them, because I think right. it helps us to understand from a marketing standpoint, we're going to talk about that in a minute, but what do they really need in those phases? Um, so everybody stick with us a little bit longer. We actually are going to give you a link where you can take the predictable success quiz for your organization. And I think it's really helpful when we start to identify where we're at on that cycle, because we start to make the right decisions of how to keep moving through. So I'm going to invite Mike Schatz and Josh Miller to join us too, Jenny. These are um, my two business partners. And um, these guys have a lot of experience. And, and I think together we've done all of the phases probably multiple times, which is what makes it really fun. Um, Mike Schatz is our chief relationship officer. So everything from our agency marketing and sales all the way through to the experiences that our clients have that team reports to Mike. And Josh Miller is our chief product officer. And so we have five expert teams, um, everything from market research to digital, web development, creative teams, all report to Josh Miller. So guys, I know you know Jenny well, you know this um, predictable success model well. Uh, would you tell us some questions that have come up as we apply this with clients. There are a couple of places where we have some questions on behalf of clients for Jenny. Mike, why don't you go first? Uh, Jenny, good to see you. I, um, it's so, um, 
it's funny. I, I love this. I mean, I, as Shannon said, love this model. It's been so good for our organization. So it's very exciting to be able to tell other people about it. So, but thanks. And like Shannon said, picking up more and more, read the book, been through this before, but even so going like, oh yeah, there's that. So love that. But the question I had was a, a kind of a stumper for me because a, a, a client, uh, actually a friend has been running a organization in Africa for many, many years. He, he was very enthused. He was on one of these before, took the, the, the assessment and comes back and says, hey, is it possible to be a 20 year organization and be an early stage? And I was like, wow, never heard the question before. So I'll throw that back to you, Jenny, because I like, how is that possible? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great question. And, and I do think it's possible. And here's, here's what's happening is it's probably again, you know, it, there's always a good and a bad of our, our, our gifts and our strengths as leaders, right? And so you probably have a founding visionary leader who is still um, operating in that more entrepreneurial, um, you know, founder mindset and has actually, we call it the founder's trap. It's kind of kept the organization stuck in that early struggle because that leader hasn't learned to shift their behaviors and they haven't, may have not brought the right people around them. So let me give you an example of how this has played out for me. I've run my own uh, company, the Foresight Group. And I am a high visionary operator. So there's also a test that you can take that gives you, helps you understand your leadership style. And I am a high visionary operator. And the danger for me is that because I have that operator potential, I can try to play both roles as the founder of my business. And I, I can keep me stuck because I'm trying to play both, which gets just a little, there's like a kind of an always internal tension of, here's the big vision, here's where we're going. Oh, but I got to do all this stuff and I've got to make it all happen. And, um, and so the coaching I've had from Les and others who are, are coaching me as a leader is saying, hey, you've got, to, you've got to play the visionary. That is who we need you to be. And you need to bring the right operator in to help put feet to that vision. And you cannot play both roles. So that could be happening. Um, there are other situations where I've seen just very big personality, dominant visionaries. And I say that with the, the, I say that meaning to be gracious because we need big visionaries launching things. That's the only way things get started is by visionary leaders who just have that charisma and uh, intensity and courage to start things. But if they, um, if they are always the only big dog, if they're not bringing in those other leaders or helping those other leaders have an equal seat at the table, they will unintentionally keep their organization stuck in what we call the founder's trap, where we just kind of keep in that early struggle because basically our bad behavior as a visionary is holding us back. That's a little harsh, but it's probably the reality. And without getting into the nuance of that particular organization, something like that is probably occurring. Jenny, let me follow up. We actually have a question somebody just submitted. What if your visionary and processor are the same person? Does that okay. happen? It does happen. Yes. And in fact, that's Les. So Les, who's the, the creator of Predictable Success, he is a high visionary processor. And um, so similar dynamic. The, the beauty of that is that um, there's a gap, right? And I didn't show this slide, but basically whatever a visionary thinks can happen in one day, an operator knows it's going to take a week and a processor realizes it's going to take a month. Like that's like the perspective they come from, right? And so you can envision this, right? With your teams, you're sitting in a meeting. Yeah, that never happens. That <laughs> never happens at five by five, right? Um, but, you know, visionary has this grand idea and it's like, you know, we think it can happen right away. And the operator's like, ah, okay, a little more realistic, but yeah, I get it. We're going to go just make it happen. And, you know, um, processor is going, oh, but that's going to take you know, like I got to do this and this and this and this to pull all that off. So when somebody is a high visionary end processor, they just, they, they typically will see that tension in themselves because they'll feel it. Right. Um, and they have to just choose to go, okay, which hat do I need to wear? And if they're the founding leader, they need to choose their visionary hat and make sure that they have processors on the team that they trust. So it is possible. I think you just have to be really conscious of it and know which hat do I need to play for the sake of the organization. Remember that enterprise commitment is that I'm going to put the, the, um, the, the enterprise ahead of my personal choices or my personal preferences. And so you can have, that can exist. You just have to choose which hat do I need to wear for the sake of the organization. 
It's great. And we feel that every day here, I would say. <laughs> so you're right on. Um, I know I know for me, be, having been in the second chair like you were, Jenny, and then moving to that visionary role, you know, I, I know I can do the second chair. I've, I've done it. I put feet to vision, but it, it is, and, and Josh and Mike are awesome at reminding me, Mike says all the time, but we where we need you is, yes. and, and learning to stay there and then not step all over the operators and processors who are making decisions and just need to be able to go. Um, That's, that's been a space that I continue to learn in, Um, but it's important. It's absolutely important. And one thing that I didn't hit on just for sake of time, but there's actually a fourth style that's called the synergist. And that's actually a developed style that every one of us, as we grow in our, and I'm a big, I'm a big believer in the coaching that I do that self-awareness is, is the secret weapon for every leader, right? Mm-hmm. And so as visionaries, operators, and processors, which are the most natural styles that we all naturally are strong in one of those, but there's a developed style of the synergist who is that, it's that ability to go, yes, I'm a visionary, but I, I know how to appreciate what the operators and processors bring, or yes, I'm a processor, but I, even though visionaries will make me crazy some days because they always have a new idea, we're not finished with the other one. Um, I, my, the synergist in me recognizes the value of that because without their vision, we wouldn't exist. And so there's a synergist style that is really more developed. And the goal for all of us is to, yes, understand your dominant style, but then know what it takes to develop some of that synergist that helps you appreciate the, 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 all of those styles working together. So that's what you're doing, Shannon, is you're, you know, as you're becoming more aware of, and all of you are kind of speaking into, Hey, this is what we need from you, but it's an appreciation for, you know, you all are engaging the synergist style to say, Hey, this is, this is where we each need to play our part. And we equally value those, those functions in order to help us be a successful organization. That's great. That's great. All right. I want to spend just a few minutes running through again these phases because one of the things that we get to see, particularly from a branding and marketing standpoint, is some of the things that work and don't work in these phases from a marketing perspective. And so we're going to run through these really quick. Jenny would love for you to to jump in. Josh and Mike just pull from all of that time that we spend with clients wrestling through their problems. And let's let's give some thoughts on what we do to to move to if we want to move into a new phase from a marketing standpoint. So we're going to skip early struggle. Um, We mostly probably because we have PTSD from those early struggle days, or we just don't remember them because we were so tired, but um, early struggle, it's, you're just doing it, right? You're just, it's every day trying to make it happen. Um, And I think that's really what we have to do in that phase is day after day trying to, to make it happen. But let's spend a few minutes on fun because we have such great memories like everyone, Jenny, we have all the memories. We share the stories. Our team will go, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know dinner at the restaurant, all the stories from the the fun phase Um, and I think that often in that time we're not we're not necessarily what we see is we're not seeing clients do a lot of strategic marketing I think you hear a lot about you know well all of our work if, if you're a service industry is from referrals or if you're selling a product it's you know it's word of mouth there are absolutely times where that's not the case but a lot of times we get there and we're getting this momentum and things are just kind of happening for us which is part of what makes it really fun um, but I think there are some things we need to start thinking about in that phase um, Mike you've you've been through this phase we talk about this a lot what do you think we should do yeah, it's it, it, well because you were having so much fun. You can forget that you know you need to do some work, and I yeah. think that's the thing. You're working real, real hard. You're celebrating the, the idea of flock ball is talked about. The idea with kids in you know soccer field or when they're little kids, when our kids are running around, they're all just they're in this big group kicking the ball around. That's well, kind of what fun is. You're just you're just getting stuff done, and it's kind of fun. You're celebrating a lot, but you're neglecting the idea that at some point you got to get more intentional about your marketing. I think in some of those there you're still running around crazy with your wear multiple hats. I think what we found and what we need, we see that clients need to do is really start thinking about getting beyond that. The idea of getting out there and celebrating your wins, being public about that. You're trying to, I kind of call it getting beyond that kind of core circle of how you got business to that next level of business, because you're not going to get to the next stage if you don't continue to expand your business. So what does that look like? That's like to be PR. 
That could be, you know, publicizing your events. It could be just publicizing what you're doing, new clients, new products. That's kind of getting your brand known to people is really important. And that's just something you can do at that early stage. Just hand it to someone and say, just do something that gets beyond our, our, I guess, our relationships, right? Mike, you made a comment earlier about this is where you promote yourself to look bigger than you are. And I think that a lot of that happens in fun is we, we've got, Jenny, you talked about we, we win that big client and, and we can talk about it. And, and I love how when you, when you build a, a presence online, you, you are as big as your presence makes you look. And so in that fun phase, when you invest in those things that make you look more established and bigger, I think you're laying the groundwork to be able to continue to reap those benefits. Josh, you also talked about, about your list and how we overlook that sometimes. Yeah, I mean, especially with the way things are consistently changing, we found that one of the most valuable things that you can continue to do is to build your email list. Um, as you get those emails, like you, you really have them and you own them and it doesn't matter how algorithms change or what happens, like email is still that super useful, super valuable tool that uh, just continues to honestly outperform everything else. So I think if you're gonna focus one area in terms of growth, like building that list, owning those emails. Yeah, that's great. Cause those we can do something with later. And we know we've worked with organizations that have been through fun and you, you say, man, I've, you know, Jenny, I remember with a speaker, a personality that had spoken to hundreds of thousands of people through this phase and they get to the end of it and they, they have no contact with anybody. And we know that with authors, right? You sell your book. I don't know who I sold to. So how do we start to build lists that we can then leverage as we get more strategic in marketing? So Whitewater forces us to do that, right? We get to Whitewater and all of a sudden we're like, wait, I thought everything was word of mouth and that was going to keep us growing. And I'm not sure that that's going to keep us growing. Josh, how do you describe Whitewater? I love your phrase. I mean, I think it's the awkward teenage years of this whole thing where you're like growing up, but you're, you're not really sure that you want to or how, the, how it happens or how you get to be. And so you're just stuck here. And I remember one thing from the book that I just hated is there's no way to skip it. Like you've got to go through it and you've got to fight through it. And so it's, I mean, in a lot of ways, it's just like being a teenager. That is so true. I do. I often refer to it too as lanky teenager stage, That it's like <laughs> our body has outgrown our brains yeah. and we have to mature, men, you know, organizationally to be able to grow into what we're maturing into. And it is, it's painful and you, you can't skip it. Um, and in fact, I did this myself of, because I had all this knowledge of the predictable success model as I'm starting my company. And um, so I, I quickly tried to like mitigate whitewater and it actually like, like actually hurt us a little bit because I was trying to anticipate it. <laughs> My company's called Foresight. So, you know, like I pride myself on being able to anticipate what's coming and help organizations and teams anticipate that stuff. And so I was trying to get, have some foresight on what was coming. And I actually like, you can't, you can't escape white water. You have to go through it, but you can accelerate your time in it if you have the awareness and you use the principles from predictable success. So Josh and Mike, what are some things from a marketing standpoint that we can do in Whitewater? Um, there's a lot of practical steps. I mentioned that in the book that we, we did them all. Um, but from a marketing standpoint, what can you do that ties back to those? I'll start Josh and then you come after me on this one because I'm sure you got some great things. I think one of the first things you do like coming out of Whitewater is, and fun is you because you're wearing all these hats I think one of the first things you want to do is say, who's going to do what? And you start saying, look, I know you've been wearing five hats, but now you get to wear two. You get to wear one. And one of the hats should be so like, hey, shouldn't someone be in charge of marketing? Shouldn't someone be starting to, to really say, hey, I'm going to own that now? Not just everybody. Like, are you doing it? No, I'm doing it. You're doing it. Someone says, that's my role. And that's what we did. We actually have started establishing it and said, look, let's figure out what hats need to be worn by who. The hat idea is like the idea, of course, that's a responsibility. But that's the first thing. And then hopefully put the right person in place and start spending some effort on just saying someone that wakes up every day and says, look, I got to work on marketing this company to get us to that next level. I think one of the biggest signs with clients that they're in um, fun or whitewater is when we schedule that initial meeting and we say, we ask, we, we kind of give them some thoughts of, you know, here's who's going to be on the meeting from our side. 
here, here's some thoughts on who should be from your side. And there, it's really hard for them to decide. And so just invite everybody, right? Because really you don't have those defined roles. And so we end up with this immersion with, you know, the entire company or, tw- or the entire team because they don't know who owns what. Yeah. And I think it's a lot of when you're ready to kind of move through whitewater is when you look at the descriptors of fun and they don't look as fun as they once were. So you look at like the stories of, oh, remember when we stayed up all night completing that project? And you're like, that really wasn't fun. Or, <laughs> hey, remember when it, we all had to jump in and like everybody was stepping on each other's toes and doing this thing so we could get that out the door? And you're like, that really wasn't fun. And you're like, I, I think we're ready to, to fight through this and get to the other side. Because one of the things I think you talked about last time, um, we talked about this, Jenny, was you can you can choose to go back to fun a little bit once you're in white water. Yeah. Um, but there has to be something that kind of motivates you to to push through it. And so I, I think that's a big, big key is just recognizing that. Yeah. Well, it's a real tension typically for visionary leaders to to you you're making trades, right? Because the visionary in the, the visionary leader, in order to achieve the scale and growth goals that they likely have. They have to develop some of those processes and systems and, you know, make some of those adjustments that Whitewater requires. And, um, and that's a real, that's a choice on the part of a visionary to say, hey, I'm going to, again, sacrifice some of what instinctually energizes me for the good of the organization. And, and that's where some will say, you know what, no, I actually want to kind of stay a little more smaller and, you know, and have more of that flexibility that happens in fun, but I'm giving up some of those, you can't have both. And that's the mm-hmm. thing that I'll hear, oh, well, we wanna keep all this flexibility and we wanna be able to just kinda, you know, do what mm-hmm. we did in fun and still, you know, scale and do, and have these big growth goals. And it, that's not, it's not realistic. And that's where you will start to sabotage the organization and particularly frustrate your team. Um, and yeah, so, it, and I would say with the marketing angle too, it's like, you might be trying to do all these great grand marketing initiatives. And, but if you're not, if you're not making the adjustments to, you know, you might, you might get excited about some of the marketing stuff that will lead to growth, but if you haven't done the work, you know, and you guys clearly walk organizations through that well, um, you're going to, you're going to get frustrated. And I'm, I'm guessing the marketing isn't as effective if they, if they haven't made that deliberate choice, y'all would know that better. Right. And when I think also part of it, just like you're saying, you make the choice, I think at this point, from a marketing standpoint, we're having to decide what metrics really move the needle. So in fun, there's also a little bit, if we're doing marketing, we're doing a little bit of everything and let's try this and that. And and because it's fun and because we've just got this momentum that's happening, we're not really sure what's working. Then you get to whitewater and all of a sudden, you know, there's never, it doesn't matter what phase or how big your organization, I've never met an organization that has unlimited resources for marketing. And so you're always having to make these adjustments. And I think especially in whitewater, we're having to decide, first of all, what metrics really matter? What do we right. really need to measure our marketing activities by? Because we often don't know that. In fun, it's just it. Well, it feels like that worked really well, right? So what metrics yes. are we going to measure? And then we start to look at what do we invest in to make those happen? I think we yeah. also see to push into predictable success, we a lot of times have to do some investment. We did, clients do, in, in different tools that we need. So whether it's marketing automation or project management or, or CRM, whatever it is, that has to grow up so that that can support us on the metric side so that we know what's working. That's huge. That's a huge piece of it. You make a note there. And one of the key parts of predictable success that I know you all probably worked through was the high quality team-based decision-making where we move from, and you said this, but we move from the antidotal like decision-making that is part of early struggle and fun. Like we do go with our gut and that's what got us to that place, but we have to move to data also informing us. And that's exactly what you said it is getting those tools that help us get the right information. So we're making data-driven decisions, not just gut instinct decisions. And that's a huge shift for the leadership team. Yeah, absolutely. That's great. All right. So now we've done that and da, 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 we're in predictable success. Hooray, everyone. What do we do when we're there from a marketing standpoint? It starts to get fun in this as well, a different kind of fun with what we can do and some of the, some of the metrics, some of the decisions that we've made to push ourselves into that. So 
Um, Josh, what do you think when we get into predictable success, what do we need to be focused on? Yeah, uh, this is when I think you start to look at your marketing initiatives, kind of like an investment portfolio. So what is that found? foundational, low risk marketing that you just know that you need to be in all the time. You need to be, again, going back to email, going back to um, a little bit of PR, some personal relationships and personal reach outs. Like we always need to be investing there, but then what do we take that other 50%, 20%, whatever you're comfortable with in terms of risk and look at, all right, how do we invest in lead generation or how do we invest in some, some new marketing ploy that's out there that may or may not be able to lead to results, but really being able to say with confidence, all right, we want to do this much kind of low risk marketing and, but then we set aside the, this budget to actually do something a little different and see if we can get some, some big wins with. You know, and I, I would say this add to that. I think the, if you've been doing, we talked about early on, the idea that I've got a name, I've got a customer, I've got you know, a lead, if you will, early in those earlier stages. By this point, you should be developing and nurturing those relationships. They should be, you know, we, we all heard the cliche, you know, it's always che cheaper to keep a customer you have than to go get a new one, right? The idea is the, that you, if you're doing a good job, whether it's you're selling products or you're, you have a service, but this time bringing them along, what is the journey they're on with you? you know, how do you make it better for them? How do you serve them better? How do you be more efficient? And these are things that are more like, they're kind of like operational things, but they really are, if you think about it, they're kind of sales and marketing too, because if the idea that if I'm bringing them along and I'm helping them, I'm helping myself as well, making them, helping them serve, and I'm just going to serve my interests as well. Yeah, I would just add to that, Mike. I think really a full understanding of what your customer journey looks like at this point is one of the best things you can do. It, it just happens. You know, we've got lead generation happening over here, and then we've got maybe we've got a small customer service team or a large customer service team in at this point. But how do we connect all of those so we really have an understanding of all of the touch points of a customer journey? Um, that's something we love helping clients with. And we come in with our market research team and actually do research on all of those different points and find out where you're really succeeding and where you're not. Where are we losing people or where are things breaking down? Where are we struggling? And when you start to know that, then we can start to put that back together in a way that really makes sense. Um, I would just also, another thing to throw in here, it is astounding to us how few clients we talk to can tell us what the lifetime value of their client or customer is. And as you start to get to this place, we start to have enough history and data to start to come up with some of those metrics. When we start to know those things, we can make really smart decisions going forward. So those are the types of things we start to look at um, at that place. And then the last thing I would say is also start to get rid of what we're just doing because we've always done it. There's a little bit of that baggage, I think, when we get to this point um, where, well, we always did that. And that all, you know, why do we, why, you know, those questions have been coming up for us lately. You know, why do we go to that conference? Because we always went to that conference. Well, that might not be the right decision anymore now that we're in predictable success. So really starting to challenge and, and look looking like Josh said at that full portfolio and making very wise and strategic decisions with the data that we now should have. And then that's really, really exciting because it keeps us in that predictable success part of the model. All right. So we're going to kind of talk about this decline that none of us want to hit. So, you know, real quick here, as we start to fill this slide and we have a, we have plenty of clients that, that know, most of them know that we're starting to feel like we're in treadmill or the big rut. Um, we're going to skip death rattle too, because I know we won't even say what Les says once you get there, but it's not really good or <laughs> optimistic. Um, but how do we, what do we do when we get to treadmill? I think we start to have this kind of marketing wake up, Josh, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think you kind of look at it and you say, we've always relied on doing things this way. And generally, at this point, you've you've moved away from a true understanding of why you're doing it. And as you just said, you're just doing it because we've always done it that way. And so you've, you've processed something that used to be a strategy. And so the, you, you can't move back necessarily and say, all right, well, let's move back and make this a strategy again. You really have to innovate at that point and say, all right, what do, what do we do completely differently? How do we step into the future here to get back on the other side? And so uh, that's, that's one of the things that we've seen with our clients is they, they can't do this by themselves or by going backwards. It really has to be a step forward. Jenny, when, one of the things you said that the losing the visionary edge, um, gosh, I've seen that 
with organizations. There's one that comes to mind right now, and it's just like it's so scary. Yeah. You know, I mean, because that's that that's the entrepreneurial thing. That's the you know keeping people going, keep fired up. And I just and I think that's to me. You know, we're we're talking about marketing, and it is, but that's that that vision to let's keep taking hills and let's keep fighting, let's keep going, let's let's innovate, as Josh just said. Mm -hmm. um, when that's gone, it's palpable. I mean, yeah. you can just walk in the building and go, oh yep. my gosh, it's missing. And I, I, it literally gives me chills. To think someone's got to, something's got to change or, or I hear the rattle. You know? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so yep. let's better, better make some moves. Yeah. yeah, that's exactly right. And then in Treadmill and Big Red, I think we talk a lot about the need for innovation, that at this point, we, we've got to innovate our way out of this. And um, one of the things that, that we are more convinced of is that there has to also be a process for innovation. So it's a little bit of this both sides, right? But yeah. you can't just say in an organization, all right, let's innovate. And, you know, no whiteboard, innovate your way out of these problems. And we love, Jenny, I can't wait to share next year. We're actually launching some things in the innovation space because we have a team that's been doing research mm -hmm. on within our clients and with others, what does it really take to innovate? What is the right process Good so thing. that we can be strategic, we can be smart, but we can also do all of the design thinking and the creativity, and then we can actually execute it. And then we can yeah. actually do something that's going to change for us and is going to um, move that curve where we're back on the upswing instead. But I think when we get to this, there's certainly marketing that happens in, in treadmill and in big rut. And it's a little bit of that, um, we're, we're bailing water, right? But how can we keep the water from coming in too fast? So there's things we've got to keep doing from a marketing standpoint that we've been doing that keep the lights on. But the real exciting space is where we go through through this process of innovation and we make some strategic decisions about how we can actually change this and not just bail water and have the boat sink more slowly. That's good. Yeah, that's awesome. All right. Um, we're going to skip the death rattle because we're so sorry if you're there. That's a terrible place to be. And um, um, I don't know, get your resume ready. What do you say, Jenny? <laughs> <laughs> well, and it, yeah, and it depends on where your seat is in the organization, but you know, usually in the death rattle, it's you're you're it's too far gone. You're just closing up shop at that point. But I would say if you are in big rut, um, you know, if you're in a position, maybe you're on a board, maybe you're on the senior leadership team, and you you know this is helping you identify what's missing. Um, you know, you can reignite um, growth and kind of like restart the life cycle, especially by it, likely you've got to bring in new visionary leadership. And that is disruptive and it comes with a lot of pain and a lot of change. And so we're talking about team culture and all that kind of stuff. It's like, it's, it's pretty disruptive. It's pretty much a rebirth, but it's, it's not impossible. It just takes some pretty good heavy lifting at that stage. So right. not impossible, but just, this is why we want to do all the work to keep us on the predictable success <laughs> side of things, right? Not impossible, but avoid it at all costs. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. All right. So we are going to send you after this, everybody that has been on here, we're going to send you two things. First of all, a link so that you can watch this on demand. If this resonated with you and you wanted to pass this along to somebody in the organization that might need this information, um, please do that. And then we're also going to send you a link to the predictable success quiz that you can take and see where, um, based on the quiz, where your organization is on the cycle. Um, I'd encourage you to get the book too. And um, Jenny, thank you. I'm going to actually ask you to hold on one second though. If, if people need to jump off, that's fine. But we have two more questions in here. Cool. And I want to make sure if you ask those questions, hang around because I want to make sure we get to these questions. So the first says, and I can just feel this in my soul because you and I have worked with these organizations, Jenny. Um, what if you're an older ministry that mm -hmm. was led by actually a processor founder, interesting, okay. and they left the ministry back in the early stage? Can this ministry survive? For sure. Um, and I feel that pain significantly, but it, it does, it does require, we've got to find our visionary leadership where, where is the visionary leadership? Um, and, and I don't know what the situation is as far as like new senior leadership at this point for that organization, but finding visionary leadership is really key to, to kind of a, a rebirth of sorts. So uh, that would be the real hard and honest question that I would be having, whether it's part of the board or senior staff is what will it take to get a visionary leader here to help 
to help us kind of reignite growth. Boy, what that's a great point. A lot of these senior leader appointments in nonprofits are made by your board. And right. so, boy, what a great thing for boards to understand this cycle, because otherwise we, we are kind of flying a little blind and putting a leader in that may or may not be the right leader. I hadn't thought yeah. about that. Yeah. And I would say, like, give them the book, like, yeah. you know, just say, you know, if it is a board that's needing to make some of those decisions, uh, you know, I would share, I'd share this webinar with them just by way of, hey, if this got me thinking about where we are. Uh, and then the predictable success book is just a great resource. Cause here's the thing for those board members, it's applicable in the organizations that they're a part of in their day jobs, you know? So, you know, it's a, it's kind of a resource for them regardless, but it might help spur their ideas for what's needed in this ministry. It's a great, great question. All right. One more question here from just, hi, Justin, our friend, Justin says, greetings from Waco. Um, I missed you, Justin. We haven't seen you in a long time. So it's nice to, I wish I could see you, but it's nice to have you on here. Justin says, before COVID, we were mid white water. Hmm. In navigating COVID, we've had to push the reset button. And in many ways, we've been pushed back into early struggle phase. Yeah. How do we rebuild smarter with the knowledge of white water in the future for us again, and still in the middle of it? Yeah, great question. And Justin, the reality you name is is true. Is that um, wherever you were on the on the organizational life cycle, you were the the headwind of crisis pushed you back. So in your case, you were in whitewater, pushed you back into uh, fun or early struggle. And so what? And you know, and the great part about that for most organizations on that side of the life cycle is that you knew you had the instincts to push reset and to just get back to that scrappy early struggle, whatever it takes, you know, pivot, 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 you know, kind of mentality to figure out how do we find a sustainable market now under these conditions. So kudos to you that you guys did that. Um, and then, and, you know, and, and again, here's what I would say is that the good news is you did some of the whitewater work, you know, cause you were mid whitewater. Um, but, I, but don't try to catapult yourself through whitewater. You're still going to have to do it because the conditions are new. Your sustainable market has probably shifted. And so I would hearken to the things that were helping you navigate whitewater, but with an eye of curiosity to just not assume that everything that you were doing pre-COVID from a systems and process is what you need in this stage. It could be. And without knowing your organization and the nuances, I can't, I can't say for sure. But I would just say, you still got to live through whitewater. So I'm sorry, you kind of had to do whitewater twice. Um, you're still going to have to work to, to push through whitewater, but um, you did some of that homework. So draw on it, but then have a, an eye of curiosity to just say, hey, is there anything we need to look at just a little differently based on how our market has shifted uh, because of this impact. So you can't avoid it, but you're going to, you're going to be probably able to accelerate through it a little quicker because you've done some of the work before. At least they know what the rapids look like. This time, right? <laughs> right so, that's right. Yeah, hey, I've been through this. Out. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. That's yeah. And, and I'll just say, I think one of the things when we started five by five is that um, uh, Josh and Mike and I had different views. We had all had been part of agencies from different perspectives. Some from the client side, Josh and I from, from leading agencies, um, but I kind of went in with this hypothesis that we could do it a little bit faster and smarter the second time. And, and I'll tell you from, from just my perspective, um, it took us 14 years to get to a certain point at my first agency. And it took us two to three to do that at five by five. Some of that I believe is because we were early on making smart decisions that somewhere along year seven, we realized, whoa, we messed that up and we have to redo it. And so did yeah. we sit at Whitewater? Yes. But I know it was way less severe because we did have that understanding of what was to come. And there was some of it that we, we could preempt. And yeah. if anybody can do that, Justin, if you and your organization, I, I really believe that. Um, I wish you knew, I'll tell you about this organization later, Jenny, but they're dynamic and go-getters cool. and um, they, they're going to do just fine. Um, we'll send you, we'll send you an oar and a, um, a life vest here, Justin, but you're going <laughs> to, they're going to do fine. That's great. All right. Any final thoughts, Josh, Jenny, Mike? Thank you, Jenny. Yeah, for yeah, sure. Well, thanks. thanks for this conversation. And I love the application of marketing that you guys are, that 
you guys use along with the life cycle is so helpful for organizations. So well done. And now I'm curious about the innovation stuff. Come on, five by five. 2021, the year of innovation. I love it. That's awesome. Thank you guys. All right, you bet. We'll send out the um, links to both the replay and also to the quiz and then look for um, more resources we have coming in 2021. Um, we're going to help you attack 2021 and everything that it might have in store. Um, but first, we're all going to take a break for the holidays, right, Jenny? We're going yes. to simmer down for a little while. Let's all settle down and then <laughs> we'll see everybody in 2021. Thanks, Jenny. Thank you, guys.